Hi, welcome to the Revision 2020 seminar on how to reanimate your failing vintage hardware. My name is Cyrus Dreams and I'm more of a hardware guy, so I thought I'd share some of my experiences with old hardware. Um, if you have any questions during the seminar, please post them in the um, comment section. We will answer them during the seminar and afterwards also. So what are the topics we are going to talk about? Some introduction, then we'll talk about common failures in hardware. Um, batteries, capacitors, integrated circuits, semiconductors. We'll talk about solder joints, the PCBs themselves, and a few words about soldering yourself. And we'll talk about modern replacement parts for stuff that's not available anymore. So first I want to give you a warning. I personally do absolutely discourage you from working on anything which is mains voltage because um, that e the capacitors in those devices uh, that they can hold um, 325 volts for weeks. I personally had a technician replace that washing machine board and I did not know that the power supply unit is on that thing was lying around disconnected for almost an hour and I grabbed that on the back side and it zapped right through my hand. Fortunately it was just through my hand and not through my heart but that shows you that even those tiny little capacitors they can hold charges forever basically. So if you need repairs on something mains voltage, please visit a radio uh, technician, ask for help uh, or talk to a ham radio guy who is experienced in uh, tubes. Uh, you could also go to an um, amplifier repair shop. They should also know how to repair power supply units. The voltage on CRTs and backlight tubes, they go up to 20,000 volts and one zap might kill you. So if you're working on electronic, even if it's not uh, mains voltage, it's a good idea to discharge the capacitor so that you don't um, give charge to any circuit that you don't want to have it on. So what are common failures that we have in hardware? You have some failures that will definitely kill your board. That is, if you have a short circuit on a multi-layer PCB, we will come to that later. We have failures that need to be treated uh, seriously it needs to be done something very quickly which is leaking capacitors leaking batteries then you have failures that just lead your um, gear to misbehave those are the ones that are hardest to trace you could have damaged capacitors broken solder joints damaged semiconductors failing disk drives tin whiskers we'll show you something about that and then you have annoying failures, which is, for example, scratchy potentiometers, switches that are not uh, really taking a push every time that you push them. That sort of thing. So let's directly go to the leaking batteries. So leaking batteries, they need to be removed immediately because the electrolyte, that stuff that's here as a crystal form, that is corrosive and it will damage your PCB. But what most people will do is they start to scratch around the PCB with water or alcohol and a brush and go along mechanically to remove that. But the, actually there's a better way for uh, um, the stuff coming from the battery itself to be uh, removed because you can neutralize that with mild acids like vinegar. And I did prepare some little video to show you that. So I do have some vinegar in that uh, tube and I'll put that on this crystal-like structure and you see that forming up. What that means is that <clears throat> the vinegar, the, the acidity, it will neutralize the basics uh, of the crystals and the remaining solution is more or less neutral or li lightly acidic. And you can wash that one off uh, just with um, water and you can get rid of the water with um, isopropylic alcohol, for example. That one is widely used to, to uh, get rid of water on um, PCBs and electronics in general. Um, if you go for different kinds of uh, batteries, you have the NiCad batteries and nickel metal hy hydride. 
they are also alkaline, and so the trick with uh, vinegar will also work on them. The lithium cells, however, they are acidic. Um, but the good thing is that the lithium perchloride, which is the crystal stuff that comes out of a lithium cell, that one can be solved in water or alcohol and removed. Or you could go for something mildly uh, as a base solution to, to get rid of that. So the next part that uh, spills stuff everywhere on your PCBs uh, are capacitors, electrolytic capacitors. So basically there are two types. Most of the time we talk about the aluminum electrolytic capacitor, which is those cans that you, that you uh, know of. This one um, has a broken seal on top here and on top that, that one will spill out on top uh, everything that's inside and not on the bottom. The failure modes, they have several different failure modes, interestingly. So they do dry out completely without bursting and spilling everywhere. So the water-based uh, um, electrolytic solution in there, that one uh, uh, will evaporate over, over the years. And the remaining capacity is just a few picofarads. It's, the, the whole capacitor is useless, but it does not damage a board. Uh, it can, however, lead to unstable uh, um, power supplies, so uh, eventually you should replace them, of course. You could get high ESR with a capacitor if, if um, some chemicals in the electrolyte are decomposing. Um, those capacitors actually in your circuit, or if you solder them out, they measure a higher capacitance value or almost the original capacitance value. So many people will think that the parts are still okay. That's what happens for a lot of tube amplifiers, but they are not okay. So um, the, the high ESR, it covers up because of the way that the capacitance is measured with a capacitance tester, that the capacitance actually has dropped and those capacitors might heat up excessively and over time dry out then completely uh, or start uh, uh, to develop low insulation resistance which uh, quickly heats up the whole capacitor and that one is the one that spills out all the electrolytes so you have an internal short that is not uh, a self-healing uh, anymore and that one will spill out all the electrolyte on your board and again it's corrosive it's uh, it, it, the job of the electrolyte is to maintain an aluminium oxide insulation layer on the aluminium foil inside the capacitor, so it is able to oxidize aluminium and keep it in an oxidized state. And that will corrode also copper on your board. The traces will then be gone. Uh, to how to identify those capacitors that need to be changed? So they will bulge on the top or on the bottom. So if if it's uh, uh, crooked on your board it uh, might be a sign that um, the bottom has bulged out uh, on that side. Um, uh, by the top, uh, if that's visibly gets deformed or even the seal starts cracking, then you should replace them immediately. Um, not using an electronics, not having power on them, uh, on the capacitors, they will degrade um, and the uh, um, insulation layer from the aluminium oxide that wall one will reduce so it is a good um, practice to power up your gear at least every five years for at least 20 minutes uh, it normally says at rated voltage because you need the, the proper voltage applied to the capacitor but if it's built into your device you just put it on uh, the power supply and that should rebuild the insulation layer for that capacitor and prolong its useful life. So if you need to replace aluminium electrolytic capacitors, there are a few tips that I can give you. And um, the new capacitors, they will be more advanced. So you get more modern parts. You could go for a smaller case size for the same capacitance and voltage rating or you can get a higher voltage or temperature rating, which I would recommend to do because um, the higher voltage and temperature rating means the capacitor is more robust. You should not increase the capacitance value, even if you can get them, that in the same size than the old one, uh, except when you exactly know what a circuit does because some circuits uh, don't cope well with too large capacitances. And 
do not replace non-polarized capacitors for, for audio circuits with polarized or vice versa. So if you have to replace capacitors on the headphone jack or line output, uh, make sure that you get the proper type. If the schematic, it's always nice to have the schematic. If that tells you is a polarized one uh, or a non-polarized one, use the one uh, that's appropriate for, for the job. The polarized ones, um, let's go back one slide maybe, they have this marking on the negative side here. Um, that one is the, an indicator, this one is the minus, and that's an indicator that this is a polarized capacitor and needs to be replaced with a polarized capacitor. So you could um, go for automotive types. They are generally high reliability types uh, with a maximum lifespan of about 25 years, uh, which means in 25 years, it does not reduce the capacitance more than 10% or 20%, depending on a type, which is quite nice. To replace capacitors in, uh, in a complete um, device, a complete computer, uh, you get um, pre-selected recapping kits where all the values that you might need are already in there and you don't need to buy each and every single capacitance very separately, which is very handy to have. And capacitors on the mains of CRT, they might be charged. So let somebody else uh, work on the power supply or discharge because they will kill you if you touch them. There is a second type of electrolytic capacitors that is the tantalum capacitor. They look like that. So there's the surface mount type and there is the through mounting hole type. And they're most well known for failing spectacularly uh, when <clears throat> handled incorrectly. So they do have the same, uh, the same property that um, um, they have uh, an electrolyte to form the insulation layer. In this case, in case it's a um, solid state electrolyte, so it's not liquid form, but it's pressed powder. Uh, but if you destroy the insulation layer, they will short out 90% of the time. They will go to a hard short and it can carry several amps. Uh, and that happens if you reverse the polarity by uh, mistake. And it's the same deal with the uh, tantalums. They reduce the insulation layer when not in use. So it's, you should also reform them, putting them onto the uh, intended voltage for five minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. And then there's some major fuck up with those parts. Um, some guy decided that it would be nice to mark the positive side of the tantalum capacitor, which is to my knowledge, the only electronic parts that has the marking put on the positive side instead of the negative side. I still hate the guy that decided to do it like this. There's a third type of capacitor that you might encounter on your board uh, that is foil capacitors. They are often used on the mains power supply and there are several uh, classes. There's the X class and the Y class. Um, you should uh, make sure you uh, use the proper one for the intended use because it's a safety feature to have either an X or a Y capacitor on the, on the proper side. Uh, uh, check that out. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, best not touch that because then you're not knowledgeable about main, mains voltage. Get somebody to help you, please. Let's go to integrated circuits. Integrated circuits and semiconductors, you have two enemies for those. You have high voltage and high current. Yeah, so uh, both of them will damage it. You have high voltage across the semiconductor. That one will trap uh, electrons in the gate oxide. And the transistor is going to be less sensitive um, and can completely stuck, uh, depending on which uh, a MOSFET it is, it either will stuck open or stuck closed, um, or uh, the switching voltage doesn't match the rest of the circuit, so it will not um, function in a way it was intended in the circuit and you have something that's not working in this case, yeah? so needs to be replaced. There's a second uh, 
way of damaging in, in those parts that is we have the current uh, in, inside here um, that's called electromigration it transports the atoms around so you start off with with a proper uh, trace like that one uh, but in, in this case on, on this position something is wrong with that trace either it had from the production a thinning already um, or there is some special heat up here whatever um, but what will happen is that the current will transport material from that uh, running trace to somewhere else and the connection thins out and it just loses contact completely so that device is then now not functioning anymore you do have a third um, damage uh, happening in integrated circuits that is um, the diffusion which means that the n well so there is doping in the silicon so you have uh, um, phosphorus for example implanted here and uh, there's a natural law that says that that um, everything wants to be uh, equally distributed here uh, diffusion law and that will make the n plus diffuse into the p over time and that is changing the electrical um, properties of the pn junctions and at one point in time the transistor will not work anymore because there's no usable pn junction anymore and for semiconductors that is diodes transistors integrated circuits um, those three effects are non-reversible you cannot do anything about that uh, if it's damaged in that way the only um, solution you have is to replace the part with something um, not broken not aged as much as the one that you had in your circuit or to get something that replaces the function the PCB board itself it can also have some quite annoying um, failures you have the solder joints everywhere and over time if there is vibration present or it's a very heavy uh, type of, of component on, on the top side here uh, you get um, cracked solder joints so you have these lines running around the whole solder joint so that one on the right hand side that's actually still connected um, you do have something different here you have pad lifting you see that maybe that pad got lifted off from the PCB but those two definitely are cracked through um, you can fix that quite easily with a soldering iron you just reflow that with fresh flux and a little bit maybe of fresh solder here and the solder joint is good as new uh, far more annoying um, failure that you can have on a PCB is if the, sol the via that connects from the bottom to the top side uh, is cracked in the middle so you cannot see that because that's inside that's a cut through a PCB that's inside the PCB but there's no top to bottom connection anymore very hard to find sometimes it's even dependent on the temperature where you measure the board so you have something that works on room temperature and if it gets hot it always shuts down it might be cracked all the joints if you have a two layer PCB uh, you can fix that relatively easy you stick a wire through there and then solder it to the top side and the bottom side and the via is replaced by your wire if you have a multi-layer PCB um, where also in the middle there are some connections it's harder to do that because you don't know if the, the solder will flow alongside the wire down there but you can try that you can try to fill the whole wire with solder or you can maybe try something uh, chemically and never did that uh, but um, you can definitely try to solder through that it's normally not a good idea on a new PCB to have uh, solder filled vias but in this case it would fix a problem and would work a few more years maybe so if your PCBs are looking more like that um, you might end up totally screwed um, so there are limits on, on what you can do with a PCB let's uh, just um, have a quick words on what a PCB actually is it's a laminated uh, material you have the copper foils which are 35 micrometers thickness something like that or even thinner sometimes thicker if you have high power rails going on um, and you laminate it together with an insulating material that is paper with phenolic hearts uh, uh, resin which would be FR2 type or you have fiberglass with epoxy which would be FR4 type so those PCB examples are FR4 type 
if you heat that excessively the resin actually will decompose and you can see that in this picture so you can see at this point the weave of the fiberglass so all the epoxy resin is is baked away it's cooked away and it's completely black and it will decompose to carbon and actually carbon is conductive you use that for alternators and generators as as brushes so that one will now have conducting uh, ways from that point to the opposite point and you cannot have that on the pcb because that will completely change the function so you need to get rid of that and you might even have that in a lower uh, uh, layer so this one you, you have um, to, to identify if you have a multi-layer board you can look out for those fiducials like this this one uh, is then an eight layer board and in this window if you put that against the light source you might see the seven in there six five and then there's another one which uh, counts down to, to one if you want to salvage the pcb you cannot um, salvage the function on that point and that one is a, a snapshot from a video from uh, louis rossman i really highly recommend that it's uh, down in the bottom the link to that um, where he goes to the trouble to remove from that MacBook, from that failed MacBook, uh, the Thunder Thunderbolt uh, um, connector and its circuit. And what he had to do is he had to scrape off all the carbonized material. Um, you see that here, he removed everything completely uh, down to the first inner layers that were unaffected. And you never will have a Thunderbolt on, on that uh, board again. And even for something vintage, that might mean that um, one of the serial ports will never be working again, uh, or you need some a separate uh, PCB that replaces that function, or get a replacement PCB for the whole board that is damaged like this. That might be one of the limits of repairing. So then let's go to the annoying stuff on boards that can fail, that is potentiometers, switches, connectors. And the fix is uh, most of the time very easy. Um, if you have a potentiometer that's scratchy, there is potentiometer cleaner. You find that in uh, the audio stores um, online or even uh, if you have a boutique somewhere that, that it goes for, for gear. Um, you spray that in and uh, move the potentiometer and it will clean the wiper. That's the thing that, that takes up the, the variable resistance of the potentiometer and uh, reduces scratchiness. Switches can be cleaned as well um, if they are not taking the, the input um, correctly. But some of them need to be disassembled. Most of them actually need to be disassembled. And some of them contain grease to function. So if, if you disassemble them, clean them, you should re-grease them, of course, before you putting it back together. Um, if the switch is available as a new part, the faster option is just replacing the switch. And if you have connectors on your hardware, you can uh, proactively treat connectors to, to prolong their life. Um, you have contact cleaner, that's, uh, that's the official name, contact cleaner. Um, that's a highly uh, processed oil um, that you can spray on there. And what will happen with the connector is you have less force when mating the connector and it helps a little bit to prevent corrosion. And uh, even if you have less force when making, you will not scrape off the plating of the connector so fast and the connector will just uh, multiply its lifetime if you do that. Uh, and I've never had a case where contact cleaner was not compatible with the plastic of, uh, of the connector. So that's, uh, that oil is, is non-corrosive. If your connector is already corroded or the pins are bent, um, Bent pins, you can bend them back, but they might have lost their springiness with uh, repeated bending. Uh, corrosion uh, um, 
most of the time will remove the coating that the connectors have, so the tin or uh, gold coating, and the copper or um, uh, ferric metal uh, base of the connector pin uh, is not protected against new corrosion anymore, so it will corrode all the time in short time. So maybe for connectors it makes sense to get a new one, if it's a common connector that's uh, a no-brainer, uh, and even for more um, rare connectors, if you can get them online, maybe the replacement is, is a better option. A uh, general good tip when replacing connectors, so they have a lot of pins, uh, most of the time it makes sense to, to cut the pins away before re uh, removing the individual pins, so remove the plastic stuff and then uh, desolder the single pins that you have. Same is true for uh, dual inline socket ICs. And there's something that not much people know about, that's called tin whisker growth. That happens uh, on tinned surfaces, which is only tin and not uh, uh, tin lead. Um, and actually, um, uh, leaded tin was introduced in the 1940s to um, prevent to prevent the tin whisker growth from happening. So what you will have here is small. Um, filaments that go from one connector to the other one and I have seen them in real time uh, in, in collector shells like this. Um, it's, that photo is not from me but mine looked exactly the same where the outer housing which is normally grounded uh, has uh, grown a tin whisker to one of the active pins and shorted that out. You can almost not see them so they're too thin to see with a bare eye and what you do see is the light reflection of it. So that you can see. So if you want to look for that, take a light source, change the position, shine it on. And if you get something shiny that looks like dust, but it's shiny, maybe you have a tin whisker problem and um, you should replace the part. Or you could try to reflow the surface because that you can melt the whiskers. They actually can carry a lot of current. It goes up to 70 milliamps that they can carry before they burn off. And the uh, most uh, likely surfaces to have whisker growth is uh, bright tin, which is the shiny uh, connector shells that are really uh, reflective. Um, they are really shitty because they are prone to grow a whisker like crazy. So don't use something like that. Uh, get something that's matte tin plated. Um, that one will last a lot longer without uh, messing up your hardware. So a few uh, tips uh, about soldering uh, to get good results. Um, first off, I would say uh, get a decent soldering iron with a temperature sensor in built in. So I do recommend uh, TS100 or the TS80. The TS100, um, which I can show you because I do own a TS100. So. so that's the soldering iron. That one is 65 watts. It has replaceable tips. Uh, with three connectors. So two of the connectors are for powering the um, uh, tip and the third one is to actually measure the temperature uh, at the position of the tip. And that thing is even hackable. There's an ST ARM processor in there with an accelerometer. So that one even goes to sleep mode if you put that in, in on rest. It has an OLED display for um, temperature and two buttons. Uh, that one takes any voltage source in between 12 and 24 volts and it reaches 65 watts if you supply it with 24 volts. So if you have a power supply already that can uh, go up to that voltage, um, you could go for a TS100. If you do happen to own um, a USB-C power delivery bank or power delivery um, power supply, um, that can give you 9 volts. Um, you could go for the TS80, it's just 18 watt, but that's uh, sufficient for most of the stuff and you don't have to buy an, something for the TS100 if you don't already own something like that. Um, most of you will maybe have a power supply that fits the TS100, because old laptop power supplies uh, outputting 19 volt, they give you 65 watts of power for that 19 volt. You just have to uh, change the connector to the correct barrel size for the TS100 and you could use something like that. 
If you are soldering, don't overheat your PCBs because the PCB, as, a, as we already discussed, it's a laminated structure and the, the stickiness of the epoxy um, will reduce with temperature, which means if you heat your PCB too long, uh, actually your trays will peel off and your board is ruined. And um, you cannot get a tin lead solder anymore easily um, online or in shops because lead is toxic, it accumulates in your body if you inhale the fumes. Um, but it would still be perfectly legal for your vintage hardware to use tin lead solder because, the, at least in Europe, um, the European law states that if your uh, device was manufactured using lead, uh, repairing it with a lead-based solder is still allowed. What you never should do is tin, use tin bismuth uh, alloys. They have a lower melting point than uh, tin silver copper alloys, SAC, which is the more common type. Uh, but the, the bismuth, which is a nice crystal forming metal here, a really nice picture, uh, that one really um, makes problems together with um, with tin and lead because tin, lead and bismuth together gives you roses metal which has a melting point at around boiling water temperature and the solar joints would be very very brittle and they will fail very fast so don't buy that stuff go for SAC solar if you uh, have to solder something or try to find tin lead solder and don't inhale the fumes, um, get something that a fume extractor, for example, uh, check on eBay, they are very cheap now. I recently bought one, so I don't have to hold my breath when soldering. I just use the solder extractor and use tin lead uh, solder, which is very fine for vintage hardware. Use flux. There are videos on uh, online that show you that the flux is the most important thing. If you solder joint, it does not look nice. Most likely uh, you uh, heated the, uh, um, the solder wire too long. Solder wire uh, has normally a core with flux in there, and, but that one is good for a few seconds and then it's evaporated because that one, that stuff will evaporate. Um, so you can buy additionally flux to put additionally to that. Um, you should um, prefer to use no clean flux. That one uh, does not necessarily need to be removed, but if you want to remove it, please remove all of it because uh, there's not only rosin in there, uh, not rosin, it's uh, what we in Germany call uh, colophonium. Yeah, it's rosin, yeah, that's uh, compared to resin, it's a very similar word, it's rosin, that's the actual stuff. But they also have activators and, and, and to make that rosin more aggressive. And if you only remove half of the no clean flux, um, chances are that you have the activator still on the board and start get corrosion. The rosin itself, it can it's that brown uh, stuff that looks like uh, caramel. It can stay on the PCB. It even gives you some uh, moisture um, protection for your solder joints. So it's uh, fine to leave it on there for... 10, 15 years, nothing happens. And you can get water soluble flux and water washable flux. Uh, you might think it's the same as with paint where the water based stuff is better and, and less toxic. In this case, it's the complete opposite. The water soluble flux is more aggressive stuff than the no clean flux. And it's water soluble because you have to remove it. If you don't remove that one, it, within weeks it will eat away your PCB. So don't go for that stuff. So there might be instances where um, you cannot get away with using the old uh, hardware in your vintage equipment anymore. For example, hard disk drives. I do have my vintage 8086 uh, PC still with me. A 20 megabyte hard drive was, was just broken. It needed manual fiddling around uh, to, to get the heads to unstick from their parking position, whatever. Um, but you can, uh, even for an 8-bit PC, you can get replacement uh, and an adapter to compact flash um, because the 8-bit mode is standard for compact flash. And I do happen to have that one. 
uh, and I, I really tried that out. So that's this little device. You see, it comes with an 8-bit ISA card. And on top of there, I do have the, the two-piece um, solution uh, where you can put the actual compact flash part uh, somewhere else in your PC with an extension wire. Uh, but you also get combined um, PCBs where the Compatic Flash will stick out uh, where the um, PCB slot is. Um, you, if you have something that is ATA already, you should be fine because ATA is still available. You can replace um, those hard drives. Uh, I did see that there is some adapter going on for SCSI to SD card. Uh, I do not own something like that. I never tried that, but that might be an option if you have uh, uh, one medium aged uh, part that does have uh, a SCSI inside, which uh, might be Spark Station, I guess. And you also have the floppy drives that start to fail and uh, they are quite robust, uh, but uh, they're also annoying because they <laughs> take forever and they don't hold much. Uh, for um, uh, data on per, per 1.4 megabyte. It is fine for all the demos because they should fit <laughs> 4K, a lot of them. Uh, but um, those low tarek drives here, they are be really nice because you can get them for synthesizers, you can get them for oscilloscopes, you can get them super slim, you can get them standard sized and it almost works for, for everything. Um, you can also go for the Chinese knockoffs. They may work too, but they are not as versatile as the Lotarek drive. And you want, if you have your old floppy drives and you have trouble reading them, you can go for the Cryoflux uh, hardware, uh, which uh, reads the drives on low level, uh, almost like an analog signal. Um, but the hardware is quite expensive and you do need a working floppy drive for that board to work. If you need to replace ICs, you know, if you have specialized ICs like SID or whatever, um, mostly what you get is new old stock. And please don't get fooled by uh, sellers on eBay or Amazon or whatever that have ICs, uh, specialized ICs with new date codes. Most likely those are recycled, uh, ground off and labeled new. And that's even worse than getting the old labeling where you actually know how old the date code is, how old the IC is and have a, a proper chance to use that. It's no problem to have the pins resoldered uh, with a recycled uh, chip. Uh, I generally don't have anything against recycled chips, but if they, if they mess with the date codes, that's just a, a no-go. So you don't know anything about it. You don't even know if it's the proper type of, of IC, if it's revision A, revision B, if something exists for that type of chip that you need to replace. Uh, you can get standard gates. Um, they are still manufactured. That's not a problem. You can just replace those uh, with ease. If you need to go for a SID, for a C64, for example, also a specialized IC, you need to ask yourself the question if you really want to go for the original, because that one is more than 50 euro per part now on eBay or wherever you get it. It's I never seen one that's in a good condition and less than 50 euro. You could actually go for something like a SwinSID, which is a software emulation running in an ARM processor down there. And uh, funny thing is, I do actually happen to own that. And I just wanted to have that because this one is an 8-bit ISA card for PC for the SID chip. And I needed to have that because I always envied the C64 guys for having uh, the SID chip uh, working for their for um, music for them. And uh, we in the PC, we have this crappy Square Wave stuff going on. But that one is actually, it's a replica. It's not the original one. It's called um, the um, Innovation SSI 2001. That's the name that it had originally. But actually this is a clone and it's more capable because it can use both SID variants and it can also go for the uh, dual SID um, 
configuration. That's what the SwinSit can do. It can go for two SITs at the same time. And you have options there also for SIT. You can get the FPGA, FPGA SIT. That one is time accurate. It's, it's clock accurate, uh, synchronized. It uh, also emulates two SITs. And uh, I think also the analog inputs are working for that one. Um, not sure for the SwinSit. One of them can also do the analog input, so you should choose what you want to do with it. And you can just replace the old part with something recreated for your computer. So I would encourage you to check those options out. Not everything needs to be original IC. Sometimes the replacement is the better option. Uh, you can have some ICs that are still produced, so the die is still produced, the chip inside, uh, but you don't get the dual inline package anymore. That's not a problem because you get adapter boards um, for SO from a uh, small outline package or very small outline package to deal. It, it looks similar to, to what the SwinSit has here, but with no additional uh, parts in there. It's just the one chip. Everything's fanned out of the pins and you can use that exactly like the original chip. So now we covered most of the parts and we now go to the bonus section with controversial topics ahead. So the first thing I want to talk about is the 220 to 30 uh, thing that happened in the whole of Europe. You see um, the whole uh, world now with the different voltages and frequencies that you have, everything's messed up so uh, but the majority is blue meanwhile um, why is that so the the Japanese they they only have a hundred volt they think that a hundred volt gives you more survivability if you touch mains voltage that's the remaining reason that they have for having this and uh, US and Canada I'm not know I don't know what the reasoning on their part is um, but maybe something similar. So um, the downside for that is you want to have power in the end. Everything is power. It's not voltage. If you need to deliver, uh, um, let's say, one kilowatt of power with 100 volt, you are running 10 amps through your lines. And if you go for the 220 regions, or, or let's say 200 volts, just to make maths easier. You don't need 10 amps for the same one kilowatt, you just need five amps. So the cross-section of your wiring reduces. But yeah, touching 220, there is a very high likelihood that you get cardiac arrest or one day later you get stuttering heart and high chances of really dying in the percent range. So don't do that. So what is it with the uh, voltage change that happened? Before eight, 1987, most of Europe was 220 volts and that has a plus minus 10% range. So it's from roughly 200 to 240 volts. Uh, but the UK was different. Uh, UK always is a little bit different. They wanted to have 240 volts on their mains voltage, also with plus minus 10%. But when 230 volt was introduced as a European standard for all European countries, including the United Kingdom, uh, they had to do it step by step for the old hardware. So from 87 to 2009, the tolerances were tighter. So the lower voltage was 207 volt, which was a little bit less than what the UK was used to, but no problems there normally. Um, and the 230 and the upper voltage was limited to roughly the same voltage as the, the rest of Europe um, to, to have uh, all the devices work in specification. Uh, but since 2009, things have changed. Um, the 230 volt in Europe is back to its plus minus 10%. Uh, but that means you have now 5% more voltage on everything. It's 5% more nominal voltage and it's 5% more peak voltage. And I checked that out with a C64 power supply just to, just to see what would happen. And you have a 9 volt AC coming from the transformer, um, which is then going to be 9.4 volt AC nominally and a max voltage of 10.35 volt. So that means you will have the 10.35 volt on everything that has the 9 volt, so it needs to be able to handle that. 
There's a second 9 volt AC, which is then uh, bridge rectified and goes to either a 7805 uh, 5 volt regulator or a 3052P 5 volt regulator um, for one and a half amps, both of them. The chips themselves, I would not say that they have any problem with the voltage because the input voltage is good for 35 volts, so they will not have any problem there. But they will dissipate 5% more heat. They are linear regulators, so the increase in voltage goes linearly to uh, the uh, P is U times E uh, power formula, and you have 5% more heat all the time on that part. If cooling is okay, they can do that for years. Switching regulators, um, mostly they don't care, so they will not even heat up more because they will just draw less power from the input side to output the same voltage on the output side. What might happen if you're really unlucky is that um, if you have very light load on your switching regulator and it gets uh, more input voltage, um, it starts to skip uh, switch pulses and you get more electrical noise, um, which is going to disturb your radio reception, for example. If you want, I cannot give any general um, thoughts on that. Um, if you can uh, live with the new 230 volts with your gear that was made for 220, uh, because you would need to check each uh, line that comes off the transformer uh, to where it goes. And if the transistors, if the capacitors, if the rating is okay for them. Um, so you need to do that separately for each part. So you do have uh, three options from my point of view. You can exchange the transformer and the power supply unit from a 220 model to a 230 model. Yeah, they do exist. You, I, it's hard to find the exact type because there's so many different sizes and uh, uh, current levels, um, uh, voltage levels uh, to have there. Um, so. For a C64 power supply, you would need a 220 uh, down to 2 times 9 volt AC. That's what you would need. And you can build that in a 220, and you can build the same one in 230 with a different uh, set of windings on the transformer. You could go for a UK power supply, which was designed for 240 volts and you get less 5% less voltage if your circuit is fine with that go for it yeah you can use a uk power brick you can uh, use a power brick that is switchable between 220 and 240 and then you have the decision to make yeah you could do nothing leave it at 220 volts or you could switch it to 240 volts get the lower voltage input but if you watch tube amp repair shops or YouTube videos on repairing audio gear. They start not changing the transformers anymore because um, they found out that for tubes, uh, less current is better, more voltage is, is, is better. So um, for the old tubes, it doesn't make sense to do it. And something similar could be said for ICs. Remember the IC failure modes, both current and voltage will damage the ICs. A high current with lower voltage um, will go for electro electromigration. Uh, higher voltage will go for the trapped charges and destroy your uh, gate. And if you um, consider those failure modes that you have for ICs, for bipolar junction transistors, for field defect transistors, diodes, and even for caps, they, they will fail over time and you really ask yourself the question, was it really the 230 volt that made it fail? Was it that or was it just the age? Do, do you just need to replace those ICs and everything will be fine again? Is the 5% more voltage really going to be a problem? So you can just find out about that yeah, with circuit analysis or yeah, asking guys who trans converted their power supplies or stick with the old one. Chances are the old one is fine. The last topic for today is the gilb. Gilb meaning yellowing um, in German, or to say it like, you know, maybe retrobriting. Um, check out the cases. You have this yellowing happening all over the place for the, for the cases. Um, 
for example, this is a TRS, I think it is, um, which you see on the bottom side, you, that's, the, that's the giveaway. On the bottom side, is, most of the time you see the original color and on the top side you see the yellowing, which happens due to temperature and UV damage. So you have the bromine, that is the flame retardant um, for the plastic. And that comes to the surface and somehow disintegrates. I've never seen a good explanation on what actually happens to the bromide in the plastic and why is it turning yellow. Uh, but you also have the UV damage. But not all cases are made of plastic, of ABS plastic. There are different kinds of plastic. Some might not even have that yellowing problem. And some cases even might be painted. Yeah? So you have three options there again, like before. You can go for retrobriting, which basically means bleaching. So you use hydrogen peroxide and UV light to activate that process happening. So in the beginning, hair products were used to, to have your peroxide blonde. Uh, that one you can use on a plastic and it will um, um, bleach away that yellowing. But you need to take care to, to check if your labels can withstand the bleaching process. Um, watch other uh, channels, YouTube channels, when they did that, uh, do the labels still look nice or did they have to replace the labels? You could go for painting the case instead, yeah. If if that's easier to do for you, yeah, blue tape the labels and use a proper color of paint. Uh, there are cases that were originally painted from the manufacturer, so then it's a paint job. It's retro brighting will not give you anything. And the third option is leave it as it is, because the yellowing is kind of patina. It uh, gives away the age of the device. Some even consider it to be cool looking compared to uh, retro brighted. So they say, okay, it's a vintage part. Let's have it look vintage and not retro. Yeah. So that's the difference. So that's original. That's tempered with. So some people do not want that look at all. So that's the three options that you have with retro brighting. I will not explain into detail how you do that because there's so many videos online that you can watch. So I would say that's it for today. So what did we learn? We have replacement parts available often. They might be the fastest way. Not all PCBs can be solved. If they are really burned up, don't try that uh, replacement is, is the better option. Um, you have a new technology that complements your old boards. You can have an emulated SID if you don't um, insist on having the original in there. Uh, it might be a cheaper and more fun option. And for those guys who want it, maybe let's buy all British uh, power supply units. So thank you for listening and have fun and rest on your vision. And forget, don't forget to compose and don't forget to vote. Thank you. Bye.